worship wherever you are. I just have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, our VBS planning is coming along very, very well. We have a great week planned, but we still need a few volunteers. So if you check out the sign up that is on our website or in your emails, you can find a place where you can volunteer if you have the time or desire to do so. Also, I was just speaking with um, Jackie Wessel and Ruthie Hoover, and they informed me that they are looking for more people who would like to join the quilting ministry. Now, this is for anyone who has an interest in sewing. Um, even if you don't know how to sew, but you still want to join them, you can certainly uh, come join them. Uh, it, their times and dates are listed on the internet. It's a great ministry. They just love to sew and talk and pray and have devotions. So if you're interested in that, just uh, check that out on our website. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Stand for the call to worship. Open wide the doorways of our sanctuary. May, May the King, King of Glory, glory come, come into our, our midst. Who is this King of Glory? This King of Glory is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Open the doors of our hearts to receive Jesus Christ. May our spirits and our hearts receive his blessings now and forever ever amen please remain standing if you will and join us in singing blessed assurance my king is coming
Thank you. You may be seated. The scripture reading today comes from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Then he showed me another vision. I saw the Lord standing beside a wall that had been built using a plumb line. He was using a plumb line to see if it was still straight. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I answered, a plumb line. And the Lord replied, I will test my people with this plumb line. I will no longer ignore. What if the grave 
Well, good morning, once again. I know I've already greeted everyone here, and I talked to as many as I could before we got started, but I just uh, wanted to say hello because I'm always glad to be up here, to be able to be in front of you, to be able to serve this church in this way and serve the Lord in this way as well. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a moment or two to talk about I'm going to talk about my dad this time. Wait a minute, did you hear that? I think my kids just breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about my dad a little bit this time. Now I know that some of you may have met him when he has come to church with us on occasion. Um, he loved to come to the, the Christmas programs and he loved to come and sing the hymns with us on Sunday mornings when he had been in town visiting us. Unfortunately, he hasn't been with us lately because of COVID and all that, but hopefully we will get him to come be with us at some point soon. But I'm proud to talk about my dad because, well, he's a pretty amazing guy. You know, he's 83 years old and he's still working as a mechanic every day, though some of the more physical jobs he does leave for the younger ones. He owned his own shop for many years, and he's still there even though he sold that shop to my brother some years ago. I don't think he will ever be not working somehow. If he isn't working on cars, he's working all around the house. And if he's not doing that, he's at my brother's house working there too, or he's at my nephew's house, or he's out in my nephew's fields, or he's working on his farming equipment. He will never not have something that he feels like he needs to be doing. It is the epitome of a workaholic. But then again, I guess that's what keeps him young. Now, over the years, I learned a lot from my dad because working in his shop was not an option for me and my siblings. It was our first job outside of our normal chores, and he made sure that there was plenty for us to do. Now, who is it that remembers the gas shortage of the 1970s? Right, exactly. Now I'm dating myself. <laughs> well, that's an interesting time because there were many gas stations who were rationed in the amount of fuel that they had, and then there were some gas stations that were completely out of gas. But not ours. We had as much gas as we could possibly sell, which made us extremely popular business right about that time. There were lines of cars to, around the block just to come and get gas because we were the only station that had it. And since we were a full-serve station, I mean, what even is that nowadays? <laughs> that became my job, pumping gas, checking oil, and cleaning windshields. I even learned how to count change without a machine. Ah, uh, but you know, busy kids, they stay out of trouble, right? That was the goal. Since my dad had been in the car business for well over 50 years, I guess you could call him a seasoned mechanic. Until these last several years, he learned everything on the job. And there wasn't a problem he couldn't fix. He taught my brothers well in, in our own garage at home when something went wrong with their own cars. He was well-respected, and he had many people who would trust them with their cars. They still do, and even I still do. But I have to tell you, um, back in the day, some of his practices were maybe just a little bit, well, questionable. Let's just call it that. I remember when he would cut seat belts out of his own cars because he just didn't think they were necessary. There wasn't a law back then. He felt the same way about catalytic converters when they, when they first came out, and he cut those out too on occasion. That was before there were steep penalties for doing so. And don't even get me started on odometers. I guess he just felt that no one would know if he fudged just a bit. You know, not a lot, just a bit like a slight bending of the rules from time to time, whenever it would seem like it would have no real consequences. I mean, what did it matter anyway? 
It's not like he was doing everything wrong. Just a few things here and there, no big deal, right? Now, if we're honest, we've all done things like this, haven't we? I mean, no, we haven't cut our seatbelts out, but you know, we have all kind of bent the rules just a little bit. I can remember a time when I would find an item in my shopping cart that I had forgotten at checkout, and I certainly wasn't going all the way back into the store to take that to go pay for it. You know, maybe a little white lie here and there, or maybe a little fudge on the time card here and there, maybe a little gossip over there, maybe some complaining over here, and don't even get me started on the speed limit. <laughs> the problem is, yes, we may be getting away with a few things here and there, and you know, we may never ever even get caught, but does that make it right, not getting caught? Plus, the more that we fudge on small things, the more accustomed we become to bending the rules. And then it's not long before we are bending the rules until they're broken. And maybe on things that are not so small, things that could carry some heavy consequences, not only for our own life, but for the lives of those around us. And what happens when the breaking of the rules becomes normal? when we begin to re redefine the rules to suit our needs, when the shades of morality shift with every passing trend, when our own possessions and status matter more than our integrity and character, when we think it is better to be right than to be kind, when it is easier to do what is easy than to do what is right. Well, that's what Amos w was facing during the time when he was a prophet. The two kingdoms of Israel and Judah had become quite prosperous, with many military successes and the expansions of their territories. It was also a time of great moral laxity. The more prosperous they became, the more that they drifted away from God. Idol worship, corruption, and the oppression of the poor were the norm. Israel, in particular, had become spiritually smug and abused power and wealth and privilege, and God had lost his patience with their behaviors. It wasn't enough to send a number of prophets to the Israelites, warning them about God's anger over their, what they were doing, and also about the consequences that they would suffer if they didn't repent. It wasn't enough that the kingdom that Solomon had built had been split into two distinct nations that often engaged in conflict with each other. Their prosperity had dulled their spiritual senses, rendering them blind to God's impending judgment. The Assyrians were already building themselves up for an invasion of epic proportions. But Amos knew the depths of God's anger. Twice God showed Amos his plan to destroy his people. And twice Amos pleaded with God in their defense. Sovereign Lord, please forgive them. They are utterly powerless against your wrath. How would Israel ever survive? And twice the Lord relented from his plans. I will not do these things, he said. But still, God was not happy. You know, this is a little bit like when your kids are acting up and they're fighting with each other and the parents are trying to settle them down, but there's nothing that's working and it just keeps going and going and it's getting on the parents' last nerve, right? Well, that happened a lot at my house. When my mother said, don't make me come up there, it wasn't enough to make a stop. But when my dad said, that's it, we all knew we were in trouble. The Israelites just didn't know when to quit. They didn't know when to turn back around and face God's laws. They were complacent and comfortable, but not for long. God had had enough, and he was going to take care of it once and for all. Now, he may have been merciful when Amos pleaded with him, but the wheels were already in motion. That's when God showed Amos another vision. Amos, what do you see? A plumb line, he said. God was using a tool 
with a distinct measurement to show him just how out of line the people were. I will set a plumb line among my people and I will test them with it. I will no longer ignore their sins. Now, for me, that is really a hard stop. It doesn't get any more plain than that. God has set his standard. It is the standard of righteousness. It is a standard that separated them from every other culture around them, a standard by which every part of their lives needed to align so that they would find favor with God. They knew it, and they strayed from it. And now it, had, it would just become glaringly obvious just how out of line they had become. You see, if we take a look at the plumb line, we see that it measures the vertical. It measures what is true or plumb. Everything that is built must be in line with the vertical or it cannot be expected to stand. It is true that God set the standard. The Israelites had the law that was written before them, but God brought the standard into full view through his son, Jesus Christ. It is no longer just in the writings of the ancients. The very word of God came to live as an ordinary human, but still yet be the perfect embodiment of the Father. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the visual representation of the plumb line. He is everything that is good and holy. By living a sinless life, he showed us what righteousness looks like. Everything that he did was morally upright and pure. He taught us how to love, how to pray, and how to serve. He gave us new commandments, and he re redefined old ones. And he gave us a new covenant where we can find our salvation. He was the perfect example of mercy and grace, compassion and humility, strength and obedience, and ultimately, he gave up his life so that we could live. So you see, the life of Jesus Christ sets the standard for us. It is the plumb line that exists in each of our lives. It is the measure of the vertical, the unshakable right angle, the constant that never changes. It never deviates. It is always true. And if we are truly wise, then we would choose to align ourselves with the standard that is Jesus Christ. It is the only standard that we will ever need. Now, this standard is the line that we carry around with us. It is not negotiable. It cannot be changed or influenced by our every whim. It won't tolerate being bent just a little bit. It can only be used in our own personal lives. It's not something that we can apply to anyone else's life either but we can reject it. We can abandon the plumb line if we so choose to do so, but that's what the Israelites did, and look how that turned out. Anything that is built without a plumb line is sure to be crooked. Without measure, measuring the vertical standard, whatever is built will not be true. Anything out of, God's, uh, out of line with God's standard will surely fall. A weak foundation will surely cause destruction. So you see, this plumb line matters. It matters in all aspects of our lives. No matter what age we are or what status we may have, this line matters. It is never irrelevant. It is never unnecessary. It is our constant it is our mainstay. There's nothing that can shake it. There's nothing that can change it. Not even our strongest desires or our soundest reason can alter the measure of the plumb line because it is always true. So it makes me think that this plumb line is kind of divisive, isn't it? It divides right from wrong. It reveals 
crooked walls. It points out poor foundations. It cuts like the sharpest of knives right to our very souls. It exposes our innermost thoughts, what lies deep within our hearts. Nothing at all is hidden from God's sight. Everything is laid bare and uncovered before the eyes of the architect who placed the plumb line there in the first place. And he will decide what is true. He is the one who will decide. Now, I don't know about you, but thinking about all this has made me just a little bit uncomfortable. I feel like I need to do some checking just to see how far out of a line that I might be with this plumb line. And I'm thinking that I might not like what I find. So I ask you, what about you? How are you aligned? Have you drifted far from this vertical? Are you following your own standards instead of God's? Do you apply this line in every aspect in your life? I think I hear my wake-up call ringing. But while this line is convicting, it can also come with a hefty amount of grace. You see, by lining ourselves up with the only true standard, we are making ourselves to be more and more like Jesus. And as his truth soaks into our lives, our priorities will change, and our values become more righteous than selfish. We will want to do the right things. We will want to please God and the more, more than we want to please ourselves. The plumb line becomes the basis of our integrity. It is the basis of our character. It is the basis of our dignity. And over time, we will reflect the image of the one who created us, the one who shares his image with us, the one who created us to be inherently good. And what a powerful testimony it is to those who don't know Jesus as we do. I mean, isn't that the goal? to live a life in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Now the plumb line is an exacting standard and the bar is set high for us, but the great thing is perfection is not expected from us. It's impossible really. And Jesus knows that we won't get it right every single time. Attitudes will flare. Unwise choices will be made. Snap reactions will happen. A little white lie over here. Maybe a bent rule over here. A cut seat belt or a broken speed limit. But seriously, if we miss the mark, if we stray from the standard, there is always a way back. There is always forgiveness available to us. If we turn back toward the standard, everything can be righted. The with the plumb line that is Christ Jesus. And isn't that what this table is for anyway? The communion table, the holiest place that we have, the place where we have the bread and the juice, it is the evidence of the new covenant instituted by Jesus himself. At the table, we put on the righteousness of Jesus so that we can be righteous in the eyes of a holy God. Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He laid down his life so that we could have life well into eternity. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, consider for a second the plumb line that we carry with us. It is a standard. It is constant. But it is also a sign of the sanctifying grace that shapes and molds us throughout our, the entire course of our lives. So reach for it and cling to it, and everything that we build according to this plumb line will be true, with a foundation formed by the cornerstone that is Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come to you now with gratitude in our hearts. You make yourself known to us in so many ways, through worship, through singing, through teaching, through learning and studying, and also through the many blessings that you have placed in our lives. 
You are a generous God. You tolerate so much from us. Mercy and grace are showered upon us because that is what a, a good father you are. Thank you, Lord. You cause all things to work for the good of those who love you. You have shown us a plumb line, Lord, a standard by which you expect us to live, a standard by which you will judge us all. This is important to us to live a life according to your will, to, to live a life abundantly, to live a life that brings you honor and glory. It is a tall order, Lord, one that we won't always get right. In fact, we do miss the mark frequently. Thankfully, you are not expecting perfection and you tolerate much from us, yet forgiveness is always poured out on us in the light of true repentance. And you are quick to forget our indiscretions. So if at that mis this moment, please allow us to share with you our prayers of confession. We thank you, Lord, because we know your compassion knows no bounds. You understand us perfectly, and you know it motivates us. We thank you for not holding our sins against us as we seek your forgiveness. Change us, Lord, and mold us, and hold us close. Protect us from evil and help us to toe the line. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you hear our prayers. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for those who are grieving, for those who are suffering, and for those who don't have enough. We pray for those with mental health issues, for those who are sick, and for those who are alone. We pray for our church and its ministries. We pray for Pastor Gordon as he will have surgery this Monday. We pray for Catherine and we pray for the leadership of this church. We pray for our neighbors. Help us to love them as you have loved us. We pray for our community. May your presence be known from end to end. We thank you for the gift of prayer and thank you for hearing each and every one. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, <clears throat> thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen let us prepare our hearts for communion. On the night that Jesus was betrayed and taken away, he was at the last meal and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. Maybe. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body that has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the meal was finished, he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, for all of you and for all of humanity. Do this also in remembrance of me. So when it, so it's time for you to come forward for communion. Um, remember that this communion is open to anyone. You don't have to be a member of our church to, to partake. It's not how it works here. Come and feel the grace and mercy of the Lord. And as always, our communion rail is, is open. Please feel free to kneel and speak to the Lord if that's your so desire. 
No one will come behind you or talk to you. You just take as long as you need. And this is your moment to speak to the Lord, if you, if you please. Will those who are helping with communion please come forward? This is all gluten-free, so please feel free. To um, there are waste baskets on either end where you can throw your containers, so please come forward, um, starting from the back forward.
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this meal that means everything to our spiritual lives. The new covenant binds us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ, not only in this church, but in the whole world. The body is never as strong when we are all in unity. Thank you for being the good father. Thank you for your perfect love. Amen. Songs is not truly the right time to sing the new songs. My prayer is that you will be faithful to the Lord and to the music of the church. Come now as we would like to sing the new song that we have been singing for the last few weeks. I believe. Please join me in the benediction. Go in confidence, knowing that the home that we are all longing for has been so graciously provided for in perfect love. Go in peace.
love and serves the Lord. In the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Will you please stand in our closing?